Head on Fire is a Patreon-supported podcast. Supporters of the show get early access to ad-free episodes, a private Discord server, archives, and more. All benefits are offered on a sliding scale, so no matter your level of donation, you never miss out. If you like this show, consider supporting it with a dollar a month or whatever you can at patreon.com slash headonfirepod. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a brand new year of Head on Fire. I am rested and refreshed after a month-long break. I appreciate you all sticking with me and continuing to download and stream the old episodes. Uh, So thanks so much for sticking with me. I'm so glad that you all uh, really loved the shows that we put out in 2022. I hope that 2023 isn't a disappointment. That being said... I think that it's good practice for you to confront the things that you're afraid of. And and I do mean you, not me, never me. Uh, you, you should absolutely confront the things that you're terrified of. Me, me, I, I, I talk to people who are experts in the things uh, that I'm afraid of, and there is no better example than my guest today. Alison Brokaw is a behavioral ecologist and bat scientist who uses her social media platform to educate people on bats being one of the world's most misunderstood and feared creatures. She uses her time on social media to help people separate fact from fiction, myth from misconception. And she's my guest today. Here's Alison Brokaw. Alison Brokaw, welcome to Head on Fire. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. (laughs) So the, like, the entire point of this show is... I'm a really curious person, and I like to talk to people who are experts in interesting, overlooked, or like misunderstood fields of expertise. And when I came across your social media feed, I was like, well, check, check, check. (laughs) That's you. So if folks haven't come across your feed before and don't know anything about you, and they are not watching the video version of this to get just like a visual clue of what's behind you, tell me a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Um, Yeah, so I am, uh, I actually refer to myself as either a sensory ecologist or a behavioral ecologist. Um, So I'm a scientist who studies how animals experience the world around them. And for most of my career, I have focused on how bats experience and move around the world. (laughs) And what I love about your feed is like how in love with bats you are. (laughs) Like, uh, I listen, I, my husband is a veterinarian, has a full on doctorate in veterinary medicine. Um, I asked him, I was like, hey, do you have any interesting questions? Because I thought, oh, surely this guy who's got a whole doctor in animal science uh, is going to have some interesting questions about bats, maybe that I would not have thought of. And he was like, no, they're gross. Oh, no. And I, I know, <laughs> I know that first of all, it's okay to shame him. He will never listen to this. <laughs> but second of all, like, What's interesting about when I've asked people like, hey, I'm talking to like a whole batologist soon. What questions do you have? And they're like, I'm utterly terrified. What do you mean? I have no desire to ask any questions. So what got you interested in bats and why are they so misunderstood? So uh, I grew up, I was the very stereotypical, like, I just wanted to play with animals and (laughs) run around outside. Um, So that's how I became kind of a wildlife scientist. And actually it was in undergrad. I took this basically a course on like science communication and outreach. And as part of that, we had to develop like a set of lesson plans and give presentations that we would take to elementary schools or public um, like museums and things. And uh, I wasn't really sure what to pick. I went to Cornell University and was studying birds at the time, but like everyone studies birds at Cornell. So I was like, well, I can't pick that. So I'll pick the other flying thing that I can think of, which is bats. (laughs) Um, And really just as I was like prepping that material, and this is 
a long time ago, but when I was prepping that material, it was kind of, it just struck me like how much we still didn't know about these mm-hmm. animals. Um, and, you know, it's this whole group of mammals. And basically, kind of at that point, I decided like, okay, when I go to grad school, I want to I want to study bats. <laughs> um, what I love about that been... is is it really highlights the point of like the more you know about something, that's like the entire point of the show. Like the more you know about something, the more you can appreciate it. Yeah. And and find value in it. Um, what about bats makes them so different from the rest of all of the animal kingdom? Oh boy. <laughs> How long do we got? Um <laughs> uh, <laughs> so okay. So some of my favorite kind of things I like to highlight, um, especially when people learn that I study bats is because there is that sort of, you kind of, there's this binary reaction. People are either like, oh my gosh, bats are amazing. Like, tell me everything about bats. Or they're, they do the, ew, bats are gross or bats are scary. And is, there's kind of like no in between, <laughs> uh-huh. which is interesting. Um, so bats are the second most diverse group of mammals, um, second only to rodents. They are the only mammals capable of true flight. Um, so powered flight. And basically having been sort of what, you know, evolutionarily back 50, 60 million years ago, um, you know, they probably came from these sort of rodent-like animals. They moved into the sky and just had all the opportunity to do all the things. So they um, developed, you know, these amazing wings and have all this amazing physiology that lets them fly. Um, There's some hypotheses that the reasons that their immune systems are so strong is also potentially related to flight and metabolism. Um, And because they can fly and are in some cases relatively small, they are able to disperse very easily. So in many cases, um, if you go to a remote island, the only native mammals that you will find there are maybe some marine mammals and bats. <laughs> um, and like most other mammals you maybe find on, you know, remote like islands like Hawaii or, um, you know, islands in the Pacific. A lot of times any other mammals there are invasives that were brought by humans in some way, um, except for bats. <laughs> so OK, so I just want to go back to a part that fascinates me. Um, and I realize this, the answer is just going to be, well, it's evolution, duh. Um, but when you say they moved into the sky, why can't I do that? <laughs> I know, right? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's, it was a, a, a process. It didn't just happen overnight. Um, and it's actually something, scientists, we have a pretty good idea of maybe how this happened. There's still debate of... Um, oh, I forgot to mention, they echolocate. They, like, use sound to get around, <laughs> or a lot of them do. Um, and there's actually a debate of if echolocation or flight came first. But the thought is that they they probably sort of evolved from small rodent or shrew, more like shrew-like mammals that were maybe in trees, and they eventually sort of switched to gliding, and then from gliding um, started to develop the anatomy and or um what not to be able to have power flight are they really blind they are not blind <laughs> yeah <laughs> tell, tell me more about that because i feel like what uh, if you were to list if the average person were to list everything they know about bats they fly they echolocate they're blind yeah so yeah so as and sometimes as... they turn into a they, they turn into a dracula yeah <laughs> As far as I know, I don't know if that one's happened yet, um, but that would be a that would be a nature paper. Um, yeah. So, as far as I know, there is actually no bat that is blind. Um, their vision varies by species. Um, so, how well they're able to see um, depends on sort of a variety of things, including their evolutionary history and also their diet. Um, the big like flying foxes, um, like the really big bats that we think of, they actually don't echolocate at all. <laughs> um, they, they don't need to. Yeah. They could swallow me whole. <laughs> um, so they can see pretty well. Um, and they're thought to, they navigate by vision and smell. And then even the little small bats that 
you know, we have in most in the United States um, can all see they I don't think they can see in color particularly well. Um, but some of the nectar feeding bats are thought to be able to see into the ultraviolet spectrum. So they are, are also maybe seeing light wavelengths that we cannot, which is cool. <laughs> I want to I want to throw out a couple of questions uh, that I just feel like are are also some other misconceptions about bats. Mm-hmm. Um, do they get rabies? They do. And and what is what's the deal with bats and disease? Because I feel like that's everyone's concern with bats, sort of like rats. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's why a lot of people correlate them in their mind. But you know, when people think of bats, they think, oh, this, this bat has all the diseases. So what's the truth there? Yeah. Okay. So I'll start with so with rabies. Um, that's always a really and even for me and, you know, on videos online, it's a very difficult line to walk because rabies is deadly, but incredibly preventable. Um, mm-hmm. We don't have a lot of diseases that are like that. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's one of those things where really any wild mammal has a chance of carrying rabies. Um, but because bats are small and if you find one, it usually means that something has gone wrong because they don't Mm. usually like to be on the ground or in reach of the average person, Um, which, you know, means that you're sort of, you've already biased your sample. You're already interacting with a bat that is more likely to be potentially sick. Um, And their bites are small and people don't always take the precautions that they should the way you would with like a fox or a coyote or some other large wild animal that if you were to interact with. So really the, probably the natural sort of, you know, wild population of healthy bats, the rabies percentage is estimated to be between like one and 20%, but the 20% is vampire bats and they're like a whole other, really (laughs) a whole other thing. Yeah. I mean, vampire bats are a a whole other thing um, because they live off of blood and that's how you basically transmit rabies. But I feel like most people would be pleasantly surprised, probably, hopefully, to hear that, like, it's 1% to 20%, and it yeah. sounds like 20% is pretty rare. Yeah, it's it's a pretty low chance. Like, you're more likely to be exposed to rabies from a neighborhood cat than you probably are from a bat, in all reality. Why do they sleep upside down? <laughs> um, the best guess is we don't know yeah well so yeah it basically it's it's probably it helps them access places that they are safe from potential predators um they're actually their ankles are backwards um and are their hips are backwards they have their the way their anatomy has set up partly because of flight stuff has been turned around so they mm-hmm. actually aren't really able to, they can't stand on the ground. Um, and then being able, flying, or sorry, hanging upside down means that if you are in danger, um, all they have to do is let go of their feet and they can get airborne and like make a quick escape. Oh, wow. So it's probably okay. some combo of like safety, um, sort of the anatomical evolution of that was related to flight sort of made it harder to stand on the ground. Um, And it's cool because bats also have, and not all bats have this, but most do, they have in their, the tendons of their ankles, um, the inside of the, 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 basically the sheath that the tendon like moves through has these notches on the inside. And so the tendons can basically act, the, the sheath can act as like a ratchet strap. So when the bat closes its foot, it essentially locks into place that closed foot. So the bat is not actually having to continuously expand energy the way that like, if we are hanging from monkey bars, we have to like continuously use our muscles. So bats don't have to expend energy to hang upside down. Doesn't that happen to birds? And doesn't like, I think I even saw a video the other day of like two owls, like one that was in a, in a rescue uh, shelter. The other that was uh, uh, wild. Now I realize obviously you can't comment on content that's not yours but it don't I think I saw I, the same video <laughs> yeah. Bir- birds can like lock their feet and like you just can't 
you're just going to have to pray they let go at some point. Yeah. So I think, yeah. So birds do also have a tendon locking mechanism. Um, I do not remember off the top of my head if the like exact mechanics are the same or not, but I, it's definitely very similar. Um, just in the case of bats, it's, it's like activated by their body weight is what lets them essentially lock into place. Blood. Do they suck blood? Three species out of 1,400 and I forgot to check today, but probably 57, three species are vampire bats. Okay. So I live in Chicago. There are no vampire bats in Chicago. (laughs) Okay, good. Thank you so much. (laughs) Interview over. That's all I care about. That's fine. No, No, vampire bats are actually super cool. Um, (laughs) Uh, so tell me about them. I, w- I want to know. I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. So they, so there's three species. Um, all three species are found in Central and South America. Um, so the farthest north you find them is like Central Mexico. Um, hmm. And then down through Central America and into like the top part of South America. Um, t- two of the three species are actually specialists on bird blood. Um, so they have digestive and various um, adaptations to specialize on the blood of birds. And then the common vampire bat, which is the one that most people probably think of if they can sort of imagine a vampire bat. Um, Mm -hmm. The common vampire bat feeds on mammal blood. And probably prior to widespread human settlement, they were probably feeding on large mammals like tapirs and wild pigs and those types of animals um, since the sort of introduction of um, agriculture and and livestock vampire bats have actually basically like adapted to feed off of a lot of domestic large large domestic mammals can can vampire bats like kill a large domestic animal like if i oh okay no they yeah so they basically they have these incredibly sharp um actually their incisors so we always think of like you know when you think of vampire movies and it's always the like canines that they've made like the pointy vampire. yeah so didn't, in actual uh, vampire that, that was something that i that was something true blood got right right didn't they make the front teeth or was uh, it yeah i've Nos- definitely seen it. every once in a while i'll see it but it's actually and Nos- nosferatu i think yeah. uh, or salem's lot maybe i don't remember but i know that some of the older movies yeah. have done it and i think at least one or two of the more recent series like it was like oh they <laughs> They got that right. Yeah, it's so always it looks weird. really weird, but yeah. So it's actually yeah. really the the front teeth. Um, and what the vampire bats do is they they actually just make like imagine kind of like a sort of paper cut like cut. Um, they have infrared sensing organs in their face, so they can find more easily find where a vein is based on heat. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And then they'll target that vein. <laughs> cut it open. They have uh, essentially toxins in their blood that let, that keep this, the blood from, or sorry, they have toxins in their saliva that keeps the blood from clotting, but also prevents infection. <laughs> mm, that's good. That's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> and they basically like just sort of lap up the blood until they're full. Um, they, yeah, will, me too. they will drink like half their body weight or some something ridiculous. They It's like a lot. It can be a lot. Um, if you catch a vampire bat after they've just fed, like their belly is literally just like, like a tick, <laughs> all kind of. <laughs> um, oh and they god! All, but in reality, that's still only like I think <sighs> a couple teaspoons of blood. So it's not a it's lot. So- oh, okay. So I'm imagining cow, like one of those. A, yeah. I'm imagining one of those like fox bats, like those giant freaking oh, bats. No, like that's no, what no. everybody thinks of, right? No, those vampire bats are. Bats. And it's like, oh, well, that would get my dog. <laughs> no, vampire bats are about the size. Their body is probably like maybe a little bit larger than like the palm of my hand. So I don't know. Six, seven inches, something like that. Okay. So like, I also know fruit bats. Like what was, what's the fruit bat? What's so big? De- like what are the majority of bats that we see? So actually the majority of bats across the world are insect eating bats. I think it's something oh, okay. like 80% of the species are insect eaters or primarily insect eaters. Um, 
like 90% of the species in the United States are insect eaters. We have a handful of nectar feeders and no fruit bats, no vampire bats Mm -hmm. in the United States um, or in North America, excluding Mexico. Um, Yeah. And then insect eaters, like they did the different species specialize on like, basically imagine there's however many, (laughs) like millions of species of insects probably out there or various arthropods. Um, And so different bats tend to specialize on different groups of insects. Um, I, so is it, is it just that they're out at night that scares us? What do you think it is that freaks us out about bats that doesn't, I mean, there's even people that love, I mean, they love mice and rats i mean like they they have developed kind of a a cult following there's a ton of people that have them as pets like i feel like even you know sharks are wildly Mm -hmm. misunderstood and i think like because of social media we all kind of know like sharks are misunderstood jaws was just a work of fantasy like what do you think it is about bats that is still so pervasive yeah so that's something i've kind of thought about a lot um i think part of it is kind of that fear of the unknown um, that we sort Mm -hmm. of just probably all have just like instinctually um, probably related to us, not humans, not being particularly nocturnal animals. And so things at night, like we, I think are designed to be suspicious of. Um, The interesting thing about bats is they always look way bigger in flight than they actually are. Um, So I think there's a sort of a, just a perceptual mismatch of like, we see this thing flying around. Like I have had people tell me that like in Texas or in Pennsylvania, they're like, I saw a bat that was like three feet big. And I was like, no, you didn't like, I'm sorry, (laughs) but that's just not possible. Um, I think we're just really bad at gauging the size and then kind of sort of, and I don't know as much about this, but there is a lot of probably also linked to kind of, nighttime and sort of like the folklore of, you know, keeping your kids in line or Mm -hmm. related to religion and kind of those ways of thinking about it that sort of gave bats the, you know, associations with, with witchcraft or with like sin and the devil. Um, Vampires, the undead, Satan. Yeah. So I think, and and uh, like, there's, it's hard to like really tease out what came where in those, um, but I think that, I mean, that certainly hasn't helped. <laughs> um, so that's something, I mean, that's something I always really like to try to do is because I think very few people have seen a bat up close. Mm-hmm. Um, like most of the time. if you What should it, we do if we see one? Yeah. Call a re- rehabber. <laughs> really? If Don't you, call animal control. If you come across a bat in a place where you're able to like get close enough to grab it, chances are okay so usually bats are not going to be in those places so that means something has gone a little bit wrong Um, it doesn't Mm -hmm. necessarily mean that the bat is sick it does not mean that the bat is rabid but it does mean that the bat might need help and the Mm -hmm. best person to evaluate that in any scenario is going to be your local bat rehabber because they will know what type of bats are out in your area you know, they will know what the local weather had been like, because it could just be some poor bat got caught in a storm and needed a spot to hang out and it'll be gone the next day. Um, the exception would be if the bat is in a spot where either the bat is in da- immediate danger or you are going to be in immediate danger. So if it's like on the ground next to your kids or your pets or somewhere where it might get stepped on, um, you can basically try to scoop it into like a cardboard box um, or a box, like something that you can put a lid on with holes in it um, that you can sort of keep it until nighttime um, or until you have a chance to, to look up a a rehabber for advice. Uh, But yeah, really not something to, to DIY too much if you can avoid it. And chances are your rehabber will just say like, Hey, if these things, these boxes are checked, it's probably fine. Leave it on a tree branch tonight, check on it in an hour. And, um, but you just never know. If I find one in my office and it gets out, uh, which trash bag should I use 
to trap it over my coworker. Um, I would say that if you're trying to get people not to be afraid of bats, that's probably a mm-hmm. bad tactic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm of course thinking of like that iconic scene in the office yeah. uh, where Dwight <laughs> sticks the bat, but I am thinking of like media portrayals about bats. They're just not very kind yeah. to bats. Um, do you have any good ones? Do you have any, any, any media portrayals of bats where Ooh. you're like, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I guess I am kind of drawing a blank. Um, I feel like. Okay. So I have a small there's, list. There's so I've got, I've got an, I was going to thank you. <laughs> Which is sort of an interesting, <laughs> Fergal is a little bit of an interesting one. Cause I think like, like the bat, like it's great that the bat is like funny and cute and it's Robin Williams. Um, there's some weird, like. I mean, the whole, all of Fern Gully is right. Like very like, you know, in, indoctrinating young hippie children. Um, so there's definitely like, <laughs> some, like, I think like I was looking at the lyrics for the song that Batty sings and it's like, goes into kind of dramatic depth. Iconic. Of, like, First of all, it's it iconic. iconic. <laughs> but it also goes into like kind of terrifying depth of like animal uh-huh. testing and like laboratory yeah. testing. But if you like actually- well, Yeah, he's lyrics, got the- <laughs> I don't think Fern Gully is one of those movies that like the older you get, the more you're just like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> we watched this as children. Yeah. Unsupervised. <laughs> oh no. Um also uh, also Hexas is up there with like like I'm pretty sure if Hexas hadn't like Hexas walked so that Hades from Hercules could run. Uh, they are the same character gotcha. in my eyes. You just can't. You can't. Uh, uh, well, okay, okay. Um, Anastasia. Oh yeah, that's right. Yes, mm-hmm. Anastasia. Good as a good one. Um, as I say, I'm actually like I'm looking at my bookshelf, and I I, this, mm-hmm. I think they actually did make a kids cartoon out of it. But there's a book series called Silver Stella Wing. Luna. Ooh, what's that? So Silverwing, it's a series. I think it's a trilogy that there might have been like a, another companion. Um, and I actually really like those because they're sort of based in the biology of some of these, the different bats that like inspired the characters. Um, so the first book is, they're, they're, they're like middle school age, I guess, late elementary school, middle school. Um, but the first book is a little Silverwing bat, which I'm pretty sure is a silver haired bat as the actual species um, essentially gets lost on migration and then like goes on this great big adventure. (laughs) Um, They somehow end up in like the Mexican or like Mayan underworld at one point. Um, And there's the, they introduce like the, the villain is, are these carnivorous bats, which are also based on real bats, um, which are potentially the, so the, I think it's my, branches of the Mayan um, culture, the underworld God is thought to be, I think Kamazots is thought to be like the bat God or influenced by bats, probably they from them seeing bats in caves. They did that in, in the, in the, in the mini series on Netflix, Maya and the three Kamazots oh, was a, uh, yeah. the Prince of Bats was an entire character and love interest surprisingly in the <laughs> end, even though I didn't quite understand that part, but yes. Yeah. Uh, very familiar but yeah so the um, series is great because it's yeah it kind of has all these it incorporates your thoughts on, biology with sort of what are your thoughts on batman i'm ambivalent and, and the bat family are they appropriating bat culture <laughs> <laughs> i think it's i have like i have all these random i think i have one or two like bat it's not even like they don't say Batman, but it's like the Batman logo, but it's like a pink workout shirt that just happens to have a uh-huh. Batman logo. Um, but yeah, people always ask, and I'm actually more of a Marvel comic book fan. So, <laughs> so like Daredevil is I'm, kind of the I'm, closest, like he sort of echolocates, I guess. But yeah. <laughs> Do they have language? Ooh, I like that. Um, Yes, maybe, kind of. Depends how you define it. Ooh. Um, I'm going to let you define it. You're the expert. Yeah, so there's, <laughs> so there's actually a whole, um, there's a researcher who's based out of, I think she's in the UK. Um, she is heading up one of the leads of this 
big widespread project called BAT1K, which is the goal of which is to sequence the genomes of all of the bats that exist in the world. Um, but her main research focus is um, Sonia Vern, Vernes, Verns. Um, she does a lot with basically how bats can be a model for vocal learning. Um, and there's some cool evidence. I don't, I mean, bats definitely communicate with each other. They have different types of calls for different things. So a, um, what we call isolation calls that the pup might make to try to get the mother's attention is going to have a different pattern than, you know, an aggressive call, which is meant to scare off like an, um, another bat. Some bats sing, um, and the songs have syntax. So the songs are made of multiple syllables and the different syllables, the bats will put them together in different orders. Is that uh, like whales and dolphins? Cause they- d- Similar, d- yeah. They like echolocate, they can also sing. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the bat song is cool. So there's definitely like, there's a lot of- There's a great to- branding opportunity. Okay, bats, <laughs> you're the dolphins of the of the air, okay? <laughs> Except I would, I would argue that bats are- probably better at echolocating than dolphins. Listen, people so. love dolphins, Allison. Yeah, I people know. love dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell people they're the dolphins of the air. They're sky puppies. Is what I okay. Think. Sky puppies sky that puppies. can sing. Yeah, that can sing. <laughs> I mean, my dog will howl at sirens, so he also thinks he can sing. So, you know. <laughs> I have a Bernie Stomp dog that I uh, keep locked out of the room because um, if I didn't, he would be all you could see Mm -hmm. um i had never heard him bark since he was a baby i've had him since he was a puppy uh ever i'd never heard him bark and until like two years ago just randomly out of the blue he just went up to the uh uh the front window i think my husband was driving up the driveway and he let out a woof (laughs) that just it just like came out of him in this wave. It wasn't multiple. He doesn't bark like a series of barks. It's just one. One. Woof. Oh my gosh. And it's so like you can hear it outside. My husband swore he could hear it in the car in the driveway <laughs> coming amazing. up. It is so loud. If he could sing, that would that would maybe be a little better. <laughs> that would maybe be a little better. Um, um I have somebody who says that they work with bats, and uh, she says, they say, uh, given the rise of WNS, is there a plan for taking unaffected bats and working on relocation and rehabilitation? I don't know what WNS means, and I did not Google that before I asked you that question. I'm pretty sure that I do know. Um, Oh, good. (laughs) So WNS is short for white nose syndrome. So white nose syndrome. Oh, I think I've heard of that. Yeah. So that is the fungal disease that has been honestly devastating some um, populations of bats throughout North America. Um, It was first detected in upstate New York in 2007 um, Mm. and is responsible for up to 98% decline in um, at least three species of North American bat, including the little brown bat, Goodness. which used to be probably the most uh, population dense, or not population, it's like widespread and populated, populated bat of North America. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a really, it's a challenging problem because um, it basically the fungus lives in the soil and mm-hmm. the, the substrate of the caves where these bats hibernate. And it only infects bats during hibernation. So basically when the bats have gone in to the cave, they've essentially shut, shut off their immune system um, in some ways. Mm. And then this fungus will come onto the bat and basically grow on their nose and their wings. Um, well, that's and, mean. Yeah. And what it, that's a bad fungus. Yeah. And what it does is it essentially disrupts the bat enough that it causes the bat to wake up more frequently than it normally would throughout hibernation, um, which results in them essentially burning through their fat reserves, you know, much quicker than they should. Um, and in most cases, they essentially end up, it's, the cause of death is not actually white nose syndrome, but it's 
the loss of those energy reserves um, mm -hmm. and starvation. So, um, so that's, that's what white nose syndrome is as far as like how we deal with it um, is something that I, we've are still people, scientists are still grappling with. I mean, it's been over 10 years. Um, there are some projects out there that are trying to test basically the, the move I think now that most bat conservationists are are trying to approach this is less of how do we cure it or how do we keep the bats from getting it and more about how do we support the bat populations that exist now. Um, so what can we do to make it easier for bats to survive if they get infected? Um, because some bats will survive. Um, if you mm -hmm. essentially, there's a, a relationship where the fatter the bat is when it enters hibernation, the more likely it is to survive a white nose infection, um, which just makes sense. They've got more energy reserves to, to, to burn through if necessary. Um, so a project I actually worked on for a little bit in 2021, um, it's called the Fat Bat Project. It's being run by Bat Conservation International. And they're testing if we put out um, basically what we're calling prey patches, if you put out an insect attracting light to create essentially this patch of high density food availability near a cave where bats are going to hibernate, can we sort of help, you know, bump up their calorie intake by, by creating- Because if they're going to wake up and need to eat and all of that more, could we just make sure that they have a steady food supply? Yeah, or at least sort of help, help them fatten up um, mm -hmm. you know, right before they, like right before they go into hibernation and also potentially help them fatten up right after they come out of hibernation. So mm -hmm. if they come out and are like, you know, running on fumes, if you, we can sort of help support them. Um, there's other moves to kind of do stuff like, I mean, a lot of it is I think going to come down to things like habitat management and really just, you know, creating space for bats to be able to like do what they need to do without extra stress because they're already experiencing the stress from white nose syndrome. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious. Um, do you, do you get to play with bats ever? Um, so I actually am not currently working with bats, but when I was, I did get to play with bats quite a bit actually. <laughs> And by play, I mean research with permits. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I all pretty much all of my research has been field based. Um, so I was going out capturing bats and doing um, mostly behavior. So I would, for my PhD, I was interested in how neotropical fruit bats, so how fruit bats in Central America use their sense of smell to find food. Um, so I would capture these bats and then I would hang on to them for a couple weeks, basically train them in sort of this little fake, this little room where I would ask them to fly around and they had to find a piece of fruit on a platform. Um, and so I would, I, you know, I would have to go out every couple of weeks, capture new bats um, and then bring those bats back to the lab and take care of them. Uh, and then the, the lab that I was working in for my PhD, we also had a captive colony of Mexican free-tailed bats, which my lab mates were studying how bats echolocate. Um, so they used those bats for that. I have a hundred people at least that are uh, asking me, what does a tummy, the bat tummy feel like? Do you get to touch the bat tummy? Um, bats are very fuzzy. <laughs> Like good fuzzy or good like fuzzy. coarse? No, Aww. like, well, diff different types. It depends on the species. So some species, so like the Mexican free-tailed bats and um, the fruit bats I were working with, which are the Jamaican fruit-eating bats, they kind of have more like short, like velvety fur. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are some bats, um, i trying to think of an example. So the the frog eating bat, which is a omnivorous bat that is also mostly a carnivore in some parts of its range. Um, they actually have like really fluffy fur. Um, Aww. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it really depends in ranges, um, depending on the bat species. Um, 
why can I own a sugar glider, but I can't own a bat as a pet? Because <laughs> I feel like the only thing that's different about them is marketing. Yeah. I mean, bats are pretty hard to maintain in captivity. Um, so like even in research colonies or even in like bat rehab centers where they maybe have bats that are unreleasable that they keep for educational purposes. Um, there are a lot of work, uh, mm. just in terms of like, listen, we love a high maintenance queen. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> like it's not her fault. Yeah. She is doing her best. Like, yeah, okay. I, I generally have to, have to recommend it's, it's in the, the, the contract of my, I, my, you know, animal use care protocols that bats do not make good pets. <laughs> Okay, but sugar gliders do. I am a... Oh, oh, is this spicy? Is this spicy? <laughs> well, I feel like I don't okay. actually know enough about sugar gliders, and I can't really be too judgy because I have a pet chinchilla, which is also technically an exotic animal. Aww. Um, but I have... Yeah, but have you, can get, you can get those at PetSmart yeah, for I like have, 10 I bucks. I strong opinions that like wild animals in general should not be pets. So no, okay. no wild cat cat hybrids no wolf dogs like i don't i think none of that should be okay (laughs) um do you have a favorite bat yeah i do Um, okay (laughs) and uh i wish i had a way to show you a picture of it um it is the wrinkle face bat i will put this up on youtube so if you're listening to this in audio you've got a phone in your hand so you can google this yeah. but if you're on youtube you just saw the wrinkle faced bat they okay. are just so weird <laughs> um i have had the the opportunity to handle see them in real life and i've we've captured i've captured a few in mexico um and they are as weird in person as they look in the photos um they just have these faces that are just like if you took like a, you know, like rotten apple peel. It's like the wrinkles. That's what their face is like. Um, but they have these big, round, like green eyes. <laughs> and a, the males have a bandit mask. So they have this flap of skin that goes around their neck. And the males pull it up over their face during the mating, uh, the courtship rituals. Um Allison, this is terrifying. Allison, I'm googling. I'm googling the wrinkle-faced bat. I this is this is my sleep paralysis demon. <laughs> what is this? This is abjectly terrifying. It kind of is, but it's also just like they're just so is cool. It, <laughs> is it is it is it so ugly it's cute? Is that what it is? No, I think they are just ugly. I just they're just <laughs> <laughs> like like I people some people will say that when I when I like say like this is the bat that I really like and they'll sort of try to go that argument and I'm like no like this bat is objectively horrifying but they're just this is like they're they're just like a, it's just so what like just to me that like nature made that and you're just like why why do you nature have the did make that but it's like why nature the wrinkles, did make that why the mask the wings the so you right you have like so bat wings are essentially the hand one of the panels of their wing is basically clear. The rest uh-huh. of the wing has this like lattice pattern on it. Yep. For some reason. Yep. Um, yep. They have these like white, bright white shoulder patches of like extra long hair. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're just, they're just really weird. I can give you my, my there... like other favorite bat is, yeah. um, is much less, <laughs> is much more traditionally cute. It is the hoary bat. Um, so uh, that is a tree dwelling bat. It is found in North America. It's very widespread. Oh my god! It has um, so many teeth. <laughs> yeah, they're they're actually a fairly large bat. I think they're the depending on what state you're in, they're going to be the second or third largest bat um, that you might have. But they are gorgeous. Um, okay, but that is objectively cute. Like yeah. that's cute. Like there's some photos of this that look like my dog. I have a pomeranian. Some of these photos look like my pomeranian, except if. If she were to open her mouth, it's death inside. Yeah. But these are so cute. There, there was a, I guess it wasn't last year. It must've been two years ago. Um, somebody had one of those like on their car, like this bat 
poor bat somehow gotten like got stuck in their windshield wiper and the hoary bats do make the most like horrifying sound when they are scared where they just open that oh, no. mouth and it's just like a round gaping yeah. hole of teeth yep. and they just hiss like they hiss and it's very loud and very scary but they are they're insect eaters um they are super important and they are um actually being very negatively affected by wind energy facilities really <laughs> yeah so they are um it's hoary bats and red bats are the two bats that are most likely to essentially experience mortality be from collisions with wind turbines. Oh my. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. Cause I the, mean, listen, we are, we are pro science. We are pro renewable energy here. Right. We love it. Um, but I do also recognize that like birds die in those things. Yeah. It's, it's a definitely a, a very challenging. Yeah. Like task of how to balance that. Uh, but yeah, the hoary bats okay. are migratory. Um, they're generally solitary. Um, and my, my favorite part about hoary bats is because they are solitary and they're, they're tree dwelling. So they tend to roost, um, like among tree branches and they, uh, which means that, right. They don't have the benefit of like a bunch of buddies. They don't have the benefit of being like in a cave. And so their tail membrane is actually more fully furred and they will wrap it around themselves like a little butt blanket when they're hanging and it gets cold. <laughs> so they'll typically That's like cute. they'll hang by one foot and wrap the other foot like around their body. That's precious. And it's really adorable. Red bats do it too. And they just, they're I, they look like little, the little bat burritos. Obviously like we don't, we don't want to spread any like bat fear around here, but is there a bat that if you heard there was one in your area? a particular species, no matter where it is found in the world. If you found, like if you're traveling and you've heard, oh, there's a, I don't know, a beach ball demon bat <laughs> in the area or something. Uh, I'm keeping my dogs inside. I might stay inside after dark. Like, are, are there any that like, maybe we should be a little concerned about them because they pose a danger to us or our beloved pets? Not in that way. Um I will say, so, and again, this is sort of a, it's a balancing act of how do we communicate that bats are, you know, overall, they're very beneficial from the environment. We need them. The earth needs them. Um, but they, you know, like any animal that, or wild animal that potentially comes into contact with humans or comes into contact with domestic animals that, you know, we come into contact a lot, there is potential for, you know, disease uh, transfer. So for some of the, actually the large fruit bats, um, you generally want to like avoid having your livestock in areas where the bats are pooping a bunch. Um, because that is mm. one of the main ways that we can see diseases jumping between species. Um, a lot of times that we, ha we have to do that in Chicago with geese. Yeah. Geese, geese poop is a big problem. Yeah. It's kind migrate. of the same idea where you know, in, in certain places, and I have to acknowledge, like, not living in those places where we have that sure. type of nuisance bats, um, there are, you know, chance, there are instances where it's, you know, it's, it's good to be cautious and just not, you know, try not to run through a rain of bat poop, I guess, if you can avoid it, like, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, okay, how concerned do I need to be about being gobbled up by a by a flying fox zero concern <laughs> you're safe <laughs> how unless you like somehow turned into a giant piece of fruit you're good <laughs> ma'am i am a giant piece of fruit <laughs> i realized as soon as i said that 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 could come off interestingly but anyway <laughs> that's gonna be the tiktok reel right there that's that's the tiktok video <laughs> um, but that's yeah, it. flying foxes are yeah, they're entirely fruit and nectar feeding bats. Um, okay. And they're actually could, not as big. Could they be my friend? Because they're kind of cute. They, I mean, again, cautioning, cautioning of like, it's better not to interact with wild animals if we don't have to. Um, uh huh. But they are not something you need to like be afraid of or, you know, snatch your dogs inside or do anything like that. 
What are you currently researching? What is next on the horizon for bat research? Is there anything happening in the bat research community that like we'd be surprised about or that might be coming out soon that like we should be looking out for? What excites you about the current field of bat research? Um, hmm. I mean, honestly, there's a lot. I mean, I think one of the things that is really cool um, and is particularly sort of relevant in, you know, post pandemic or in pandemic times um, is, you know, bat sort of had this like resurgence of sort of this bad reputation of they having contributed to (laughs) this scenario unfairly. Um, But there's actually quite a lot of cool work coming out of projects like Bat1K um, and sort of a lot of these sort of bigger collaborative, like natural history type research programs that are designed to really try to get at just like what makes bats so good at avoiding um, or like avoiding disease or what makes their immune system let them able to like not get a fever, even if they have, um, if they're infected with something. And so there's a lot of cool work that's coming out around that. There's a lot of cool work around like longevity. So bats on average live a lot longer than you would expect based on their body size. So generally the smaller an animal is. because they're vampires, Allison. That's because they're (laughs) vampires. But honestly, like immortality, if we figured it out, it's going to be thanks to bats. Um, Really? Yeah. So, so bat, like the smaller you are, generally the higher your metabolism and the shorter your lifespan, you know, think of mice oh, no. and things like that, which, you know, only live. Maybe. Wait, I'm six foot six. I'm going to live forever. <laughs> um, so bats live a lot longer and they, so there's actually some potentially cool, like figuring out the mechanisms behind that. And I think there's also potential people are looking into like, you know, what can that tell us about cancers and what can that tell us about sort of other, other things that humans experience, um, so I don't want to say that like, oh, we're going to promise like the drugs to cure these things. But there's definitely a lot of a lot of things we can learn from just how bats have able to solve these problems. Um, and just, you know, both for the sake of like learning, but also for potential, like how can we apply these types of this type of knowledge? So there are a few people who asked me when I said that I was going to be speaking with you. Um, there are a few people that are wondering there's these bat houses mm-hmm. that you can get to like attract bats to your place. I guess yeah. if you're, you know, really wanting to get rid of mosquitoes the natural way or something. <laughs> um, one, do you recommend people get those? Do you have it? Sorry, maybe not recommend. I realize that can be spicy. Do you have thoughts on bat houses? And two, if you are pro bat house, how do you recommend people attract them? Because I had a lot of people write in and say. I bought this house and there's no bats in it. Yes. So I do have thoughts. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I, in general, I think bat houses are great. Um, I mean, okay. like I said, I think anything that we can do to help support wild populations in places, particularly in areas where, um, you know, maybe there we've, we've, we've raised the right, the forest and there are now no natural roosts. And so yes, mm-hmm. like heck Yes give the bats a new option. Um, Unfortunately, a large number of products that you can find online that are bat houses are probably just not very well designed. Um, Mm. Bats can be a little bit picky and it does depend on the type of bats that are in your area. So different bat species have different preferences. Um, So if you want a bat house, um, the best things are to try to figure out what bats would be likely to inhabit that bat house. Cause some bats also just don't like living around people. So they are going to stay away. Um, see if there's uh, just information, a lot of like university extension programs are starting to have sort of information where you can get more detailed info on like, Hey, this bat likes if the bat, the box is facing the sun this many hours. Um, or, you know, this design of box is better for this species of bat. A different design is better for another species. Um, and then it a lot of it just comes down to patience. So you might put up a bat box and it might be instantly inhabited. It might never be inhabited. Or it might just mm-hmm. take some number of years. Um, 
it depends on, again, the bats that are in your area. It depends on the availability of other places to roost. So, you know, if you live near a forest and the bats maybe have a spot that they already like to go to, they're probably maybe not going to be as likely to move in. I will say, and this, this is a pet peeve, is do not fall for bat lure or pheromone sprays. Those are scams. Mm -hmm. They will not work. <laughs> Save your money. <laughs> um, I literally, like the first half of my PhD was trying to figure out how to get bat, insect eating bats to pay attention to odors. And it like did not really work. So I'm just like, nope, don't, don't even do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, unfortunately it's just some of it's luck. Some of it's, you know, having the right combo of things at the right time. Uh, but overall, I think they're a, a good thing for people to do to help, help bats in their area. Somebody asked me, if you could recategorize ta taxonomy, would you categorize them as mammals? Or yeah. would bat would would bat be it sorry, would bat be its own category? Um, no, I think I think bats would stay in mammals. Um, I mean, as far I mean, aside from the flight, which really is one of the th is the thing that just separates them from other mammals, they are pretty everything else is pretty consistent. Um, they have fur, they give birth to live young, um, they nurse those young, um, trying to think of what are some of the other characteristics of mammals. I mean, like a lot of their skeletal, uh, characteristics are all consistent with various mammal history. Um, so I think, I think they're in a good spot taxonomically. <laughs> Well, Allison, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, I do want to be respectful of it. If there is one last bit of advice or one last fun fact or one last little thing that you would want people to know from a conversation with a batologist, uh, what would that one thing be that we haven't covered? Or that you want to like make sure to hit on before yeah, we're Yeah, I mean, I think just like – Kind of we've talked about is just bats do have this like kind of confusing reputation and i think just um you know having sort of a res i mean respect for all living things and all wildlife um but i think also just like one of the things that just makes bats so cool is they are so diverse there is still so much we don't know um there's things that we can learn about them that, you know, have the potential to benefit us, but there's also lots of stuff that we will probably learn that is just like, I don't know, that kind of blows your mind that nature made that happen somehow. Um, and then just, you know, ultimately that bats are a really important part of a functioning, healthy ecosystem. And, you know, that means figuring out how to, coexist with them in ways that is good for both them and for us. <laughs> uh, you have to answer this question without thinking whatsoever. Um, if you could remove, if no, not if you could, if one thing had to be removed from the ecosystem tomorrow, is it wasps or bats? You have to wasps. answer. You have just got to go. That's a terrible choice I, though. I had an actual answer. It would be mosquitoes, but actually even that's a <laughs> terrible answer because bats eat mosquitoes. <laughs> Picks. Thank you so much. <laughs> if people want to get in, <laughs> if people want to get in touch with you, uh, where can they do that online? Um, so you can find me on pretty much all the socials. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, um, and it is at a l y b underscore Batgirl. Aw, yeah. well, thank you so much, I Allison. That. I do appreciate your time, uh, and and thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This is, I'm always down to talk about pets. My eternal nocturnal gratitude to my guest today, Alison Brokaw. Please make sure to go find her on social media and let her know what your favorite type of bat is. If you like this show and you want to support it, there are a number of ways to help. Uh, consider sharing it with your friends on social media. That's really the best way of helping little podcasts like mine grow. You could also like or rate the show five stars on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And while you're there, leave a review. Literally any string of words or emojis helps other listeners like you find the show. 
If you hate the ads at the beginning and end of each episode, consider joining my Patreon on a monthly basis. Patrons receive additional audio and video content, as well as archived episodes, a private Discord server, and the opportunity to help me put together question lists for future guests, as well as fun sneak surprises as, as future projects that I am currently working on, <laughs> that I spent my break working on, uh, get going. <laughs> so there you go. Secret secrets. <laughs> you can sign up at patreon.com slash head on fire pod. If you'd like to connect with me on social media, and why wouldn't you? I am on uh, Twitter and Instagram and uh, TikTok as at head on fire pod everywhere. I'm going to go. But before I do one last thing, the name is Batty. The logic is erratic. Potato in a jacket. Toys in the attic. I rock and I ramble, my brain is scrambled. Rap like an animal, but I'm a mammal. I've been brain fried, electrified, infected and injected, vivisected and fed pesticides. My face is all cut up, my radar's all shut up. Nurse, I need a checkup from the neck up. I'm batty. Be well. <laughs> <laughs>